speaker, speaker is Justin McNulty. Can I start by offering my condolences to the four families who have now lost loved ones to the coronavirus? I want to once again pay a tribute to our healthcare workers and wish them well in the enormous challenge they now face, and especially those who are literally getting a baptism of fire. I also want to pay a tribute to our key workers, including our healthcare teams, our pharmacists, our shopkeepers and retail workers, home care teams, refuse collectors, food producers, council workers, farmers, the media, who are playing a very important role in, in communicating the important messages that need communicated. Some workers are able to retreat to their homes, to their bunkers and protect themselves from the invisible bombs that are trying to, trying to penetrate those bunkers. And it's so crucial that those, as many people as possible stay at home, but we must recognise that others do not have that luxury and are out there on the front line playing their part to defeat this virus. I also want to recognise the sports stars who have made important contributions over the last number of days, likes of Michael Conlon or Rory Grugan, the RMAC captain, who are telling people strongly and firmly to stay at home. I empathise with families, employees, professionals, business owners, business people, the self-employed and the freelancers. There is so much uncertainty and we need the certainty coming from here and from our ministers with robust responses to the queries that they raise. And there will be financial pain. But remember, priority number one is staying alive. In an ideal world, come Corla, we have weeks and months to scrutinise such a bill as this. That is not possible, as we are on the brink of an extraordinary crisis. The measures proposed are harsh but necessary. The coronavirus, COVID-19, is a global force majeure. I'm speaking now in my capacity as SDLP health spokesperson and as a member of the Education Committee and as an MLA for Nuri Narma. I have some observations and comments in relation to the LCM that I'd like to put on record and also some concerns I want to raise on behalf of my constituents. I welcome the sunset clause or more properly referred to as an amendment for review as an amendment for review after six months. I want to once again raise the issue of personal protective equipment, especially for healthcare workers and for domiciliary care teams and for teachers, for shop assistants and retail workers, food producers. Can councils play their part in providing those? I welcome the testing numbers have gone up to 1,100 a day and that's crucially important, especially for healthcare workers. We do not need our doctors, nurses, or consultants quarantined, quarantined for two weeks because of a head cold. In relation to this bill, disabled people have expressed their serious concerns. They believe this bill will effectively remove their rights to social care. And this could mean the difference between life and death for them. They need reassurance. They need contingency planning implemented immediately to put them at ease. Schools have been repurposed as child-minded facilities. And whilst everybody recognises we must play our part, we must play a role in defeating this coronavirus, they need more guidance and more, clear, more certainty around that. And they need that PPE I've mentioned. And we must recognise our number one duty is to allow our frontline healthcare workers to provide the service that they provide. It's going to be so crucial in the weeks and months ahead. How will they have 24-7 capability of providing that facility if we don't have adequate childcare facilities for them? Students want to know, will they be liable for the next quarter's rent? 
it's crucially important that we educate, communicate, communicate, communicate at every opportunity. And what role does our public broadcasting service have in that regard? I welcome the emergency registra registration and re-registration measures to boost our healthcare and staff, staff, sorry, healthcare and staff numbers. I want to wish our doctors, nurses, consultants, porters, cleaners, radiologists, admin and triage teams all the best of luck in the huge challenge you all now face in the weeks and months ahead. You are our bulwark and our spearhead. I know that all your force will move in one direction to defeat this virus. I challenge us all to innovate and think outside the box in our shared quest to defeat this common enemy, the coronavirus, COVID-19. I applaud the examples we've already seen on this island. GEA Stadia repurposing as drive-through testing sites, Parky Keeve, Nolan Park and our HQ at Crow Park. Can Sports Stadia up here be repurposed in the same manner? The repurposing of the O'Neill's factory in Straban, where staff who would otherwise have been laid off are now manufacturing scrubs for our healthcare teams. The owners of the Armagh City Hotel have offered their premises to help our Southern Trust if required. We have huge collective intelligence. What way can we think outside the box? What, what, how can we hack? How can our manufacturing capacity be hacked to produce makeshift ventilators if necessary? I applaud the members of this assembly for their efforts. I applaud our ministers. We are all under extraordinary pressure. Our healthcare workers and our frontline workers are under extraordinary pressure. But that pressure is a privilege. I applaud our Minister for Health, who is under extraordinary pressure. But that pressure is a privilege. We all have a duty to play our part in defeating this virus. And I wish us all well in the challenges ahead. I call Matthew O'Toole. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I too um, would like to um, pay tribute to um, our healthcare workers, um, really everyone across the range of our NHS who right now is doing their utmost to protect us from this appalling virus, uh, to keep us safe. And to, um, and to protect the public and to mitigate the effects of what is the biggest public health emergency in any of our lifetimes. Um, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I rise to support this motion with concerns um, about its content, as others have outlined, but I'm afraid much greater concerns about the consequences of this virus if we had continued as normal or almost as normal. This, coronas, this coronavirus bill grants extraordinary powers to government and public bodies, both here and in London. Powers that both curtail the freedom of individuals and reduce the legal obligations that certain bodies have towards citizens. To be clear, in anything close to normal circumstances, this legislation would be unconscionable and unacceptable. As of course, with the speed at which the bill was passed at Westminster and the amount of time we in this assembly have had to consider the enormous implications for our constituents and indeed for our way of life. To take one example, this bill lessens the duty on care providers in relation to adult social care with people, for people with disabilities. The disabled community is understandably concerned. Not only are many disabled people at higher risk from COVID-19 complications, but the societal restrictions we are imposing place in grave danger the support many need to live their lives, which is why hopefully we, need, we will get clearer guidance from social care authorities to reassure them that everything possible is being done to protect disabled people while limiting the spread of this disease. There are many other specific discrete concerns I have and colleagues in this chamber have with this legislation, including but not limited to the potential incursion of immigration officials into healthcare provision and the extremely broad powers of detention which are included in the bill. 
It is therefore welcome that moves have been made to ensure that the bill is reviewed after six months, and we should all hope that it is repealed as speedily as possible, notwithstanding uh, our ability to control this virus. I think it's worth saying, if this bill does its job, it will be off the statute book in Westminster, and indeed its provisions that relate to Northern Ireland will be off the statute book as quickly as possible. But we cannot pretend that grave and unpleasant choices do not lie ahead of us. This bill is one of those choices. But clinicians and staff across our NHS will face far more stark and immediate choices in the days and weeks ahead. This bill, unpleasant as it may be, is ultimately about giving them the best possible chance of saving as many lives as possible. But lives will be lost. Northern Ireland is a small place. Very soon it is likely that someone known to a member of this chamber will be directly affected by this virus. Very soon someone from this chamber may be grieving over the loss of a loved one to this virus. And the ability to grieve will, in a sense, be one of the victims of this virus. Funeral rites are particularly important on the island of Ireland, across all denominations, and none. Though I am personally no longer religious, one of the greatest worries I have is not just that our communities are facing death, but facing death without some of the consolations that cushion the force of death. Many people will not be able to be with their loved ones in their final moments, moments and their ability to hold wakes and funerals may be curtailed. Difficult as it is to face up to, we must be honest with ourselves and honest with the people we represent as leaders in our community. Even in the best case scenario, we are not only talking about significant levels of death, we are curtailing, albeit for the greater good, families and communities' ability to say goodbye according to treasured, sometimes even sacred, customs. When we come through this, and we will, we and all societies will have a period of collective grief to go through, but also, hopefully, relief. Relief that it is over and that we took hard decisions to limit the suffering that this virus caused. Most of us are still today grieving the loss of not just luxuries but basic liberties, the ability to meet a friend for a pint, or to go to the cinema or a football match, or perhaps most painfully of all, the ability to be close to people we love, especially those who are vulnerable and afraid. We are, in a sense, grieving for a loss of civilization, at least temporarily. The poet Michael Longley from South Belfast, writing about our own troubles, wrote of the importance of civilization in the midst of the darkest times. The opposite of war, he wrote, and we are now living through a kind of war, was not necessarily peace, but civilization. He wrote, our cobbler mends shoes for everybody. Our butcher blends into his best sausages, leek, garlic, honey. Our corner shop sells everything from bread to kindling. What can bring peace to people who are not civilized? All of these people, alive or dead, are civilized. Mr. Deputy Speaker, we are sacrificing some of our civilization today, hopefully in the hope that we will quickly get it back and with as many of our loved ones still with us as possible. I call Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. We do indeed live in extraordinary and worrying times. This is a period of great uncertainty, of the unknown. We have so many questions and so few answers, and we now enter a time with this legislation that we would never have thought of only months, if not weeks ago. I must pay tribute, like others in this chamber, to the NHS staff, the key workers, the front line, the blue lights, those who are going over and above at this time. Just a few short months ago, these people were having to take strike action in order for their voices to be heard on equal pay, and now we are calling on them with extreme pressure being put on them, literally tasked with saving people's lives. They are the ones coming in on their day off to record powerful social media videos to try and encourage people to do the right thing. Nurses and healthcare staff are having to be redeployed, retrained in an emergency situation. And there also have also been great examples across Northern Ireland of community cohesion, of those volunteering their time and services to help the elderly, the vulnerable, and for those who are isolating. Businesses are offering free services to coordinate help, community groups doing the rounds identifying people who need it, offers of dog walking, of shopping, or just a phone call for a chat on the phone. It is heartwarming to say the least, and it will not be forgotten. And our condolences must also be, also be extended to families who have already bere been bereaved by COVID-19. And now to the bill in this chamber today. Appropriate and necessary measures need to be taken by the government and governments across the UK and Ireland to protect our health and protect our lives. 
but we have serious concerns with this bill, most of which have already been covered either in this chamber or in the House of Commons yesterday. And I will not go over old grounds and address what other members have already spoken about, but I do need to highlight some key issues. The Government wishes to have this bill in place for two years, which is far too long. They want parliamentary scrutiny after one year, again far too long, and raises significant concerns over necessity and proportionality. I welcome the Sixth Month Amendment, but we have to ask ourselves, does it actually go far enough? We need in this chamber and in Westminster is frequent reviews of the provisions so that they are so that they are called on, switched on at the time, and we need to ensure that human rights are complied with and that there are proper checks and balances on what government powers are being utilised for. Provisions allow for the detention of people who are potentially infected, with police and immigration officers empowered to use reasonable force to implement these laws. But what of those with mental health conditions? Fewer doctors' opinions are required fewer certifications and the extension or removal of certain time limits for detention and transfer. In Northern Ireland, this will also remove the need for an approved social worker to carry out certain functions. Timelines will be changed and people with mental health conditions can be detained longer. We must proceed with extreme caution here. In Northern Ireland, we don't have any independent mental capacity advocates yet. Do unapproved staff have the experience and the expertise to make these types of decisions? Will there be a review after this period of time is over to ensure that all those placed under a de deprivation of liberty safeguard was done so properly? Within our prisons, we heard from the Minister yesterday, the challenges faced by the service should not be underestimated. We have just under 1,600 people in custody, and we know that many of those there suffer from mental health conditions, have addiction issues, and have a history of self-harm. Many of those in prisons fall into the high-risk category in terms of age and medical condition, and we need to ensure that those otherwise would have, have had visits from their families and others continue to happen in different forms, and all measures are being put in place to facilitate contact given the daily struggles, particularly around mental health and attempts to continue, continue some sort of family and social structure. We must ensure support is there for our prison staff, mainly, many of whom are facing difficult decisions over their family with childcare issues and safety and work. We must be aware that if any prisoners are subject to early release, that this does not have adverse impacts on victims or those who are in for sexual or domestic violence offences. And I would encourage the Department to ensure that the description they use for these categories of prisoners must be fully checked, balanced and necessary. Many of the measures highlighted in this bill raise concerns over human rights and personal liberty by removing individual freedoms. While it is understandable that the government has serious concerns on the system's capacity to cope, which is inherently true with our health service, this should not result in the circumstances of lack of scrutiny, oversight, protocol in place for people's protection and regulation, which could lead to abuse of power and unnecessary suffering. What of the testing levels? And I note the Minister's comments earlier on introducing this um, LCM, but is it enough? The bill does not adequately address how to prevent such abuses, nor it does not include provisions to protect the most vulnerable in our society, who will undoubtedly be the worst hit during this crisis. And I would encourage the government to put in all necessary provision in place to ensure that all people are protected during this time. With the Prime Minister's statement last night, the country is in a stage of lockdown, with some serious restrictions on movement to be enforced. But we do not actually know what this means for people who need to put food on their tables, and we must get detailed information for people who need it the most. How is this going to be enforced? When? What does it mean about the use of force equally across the board? And where is the oversight? I got messages last night after Barca's statement from concerned parents. Would they be allowed to bring their children to another parent's house? How does this work for family members who care for one another but don't live together? Will they be fine for bringing their kids to their mother's house or vice versa? This, not to mention the fact that we don't know how long this will be in place for, is putting fear into the heart of our society. Under this bill, the PSNI will be given new powers to enforce isolation when a transmission control period has been declared. It is presumed that police officers and public health officers will consult before people are taken in for testing, but the lack of stringent protocol in this regard is quite striking. Limited detail on who public health officers are and where do people go after testing. Where are these test centres and how are these risks being managed? We have little clarity here on how this will be enforced and no clarity on the legal boundaries. We also have to be minded on what's not in this bill, specifically protections for our most vulnerable and any further clarity that we so desperately need. Where are the protections for those who rent, even if they are lucky enough to receive wages from an employer? 
having to continue to pay landlords who are receiving a mortgage holiday and for those already facing eviction in the private rented sector, what do we do about them? How can this be managed to ensure that we do not have people losing their homes in general, especially at this time? And how are frontline workers being drafted full time into work or increased hours going to pay for increased childcare need? Will the childcare even be open? What are the provisions for those who have no recourse to public funds, for those in the precarious immigration system? What of those in poverty who struggle daily and are facing this crisis too? What of those currently in an abusive household, as well as those that may find themselves in an abusive household throughout this time? Will someone, say, who lives in a domestic violence situation be forced back into that home by the very authorities that are there to protect them? What about those who are homeless? How will they support it, be supported in a safe, secure and rights-based manner? And how we can, can we protect them and surely that they can be safely isolated? I have been asking, but I still have not received any answers. Will government increase funding for staff workers and refuges, for hostel provision, and ensure that these frontline workers are protected in this crisis too? Will we have a fully funded and resourced mental health system to deal with the reality of what we're facing now and in the future? Where is the support for the zero-hour contracts, for the agency staff, the freelancers, the self-employed, like my father, the sole earner of his household, who will now have to make the difficult choice not to work with minimal future income to protect himself and my family? I noted the comments made by Mr Nesmith about the construction sector, but how am I supposed to advise my father when he wonders if he should go to work as a self-employed builder if he cannot get the materials that he needs? How are they to pay their bills, their rent, buy their food and necessary items? It certainly won't be covered by statutory sick pay. No matter when it can be applied from, it's simply not enough. Could anyone in this chamber actually live on £94 a week and meet their financial commitments? Those gardeners, builders, carpenters, plasterers, plumbers, electricians, the personal trainers, the musicians, the therapists and counsellors, photographers, yoga teachers, the makeup artists and the beauty therapists, the comedians, the suppliers, the middlemen and women, the small business owners who have no staff, those with no premises. The list is not exhaustive, but it's just a taste of the people who have been reaching out for help. Do they go and get a business loan, which they will have to pay back, which is not a wage, but just kicks the financial can down the line? MLAs have been inundated with queries, and of course we've had our own, but we have constituents asking what's going to be in place for them, and we still do not have any answers. Why did we not use this opportunity to put in a universal basic income? It was a complete missed opportunity. Mr Deputy Speaker, as I opened with, appropriate and necessary me measures need to be taken by government, but we do need to continue with appropriate checks and balances, and ordinarily I could never support something like this, which is so far-reaching and life-changing. I note that Scotland are supporting this LCM, but they are also working to bring their own emergency legislation into play. And I wonder and welcome the comments from Mr Given earlier on in this too. Could this Assembly not do this too? Or are we content in following Mr Johnson? Never before have we been asked to provide consent so much for so much curtailment in society, and only in these exceptional circumstances can this happen. Thank you. I call Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I won't take long, Minister, and I think there are more questions than answers, but just to say that um, I hope that in the coming days that the Executive will be able to provide greater clarity than the Westminster Government has. Um, can I, as a member of the, I declare an interest as a member of the Policing Board, Mr Deputy Speaker, but also put on record our thanks to the police officers who will be having to enforce many of these regulations where there's an absence of clarity, their job will be made much more difficult. But as members here will know, and I hope recognise, that the police service of Northern Ireland are the envy of Western Europe in terms of the human rights compliance, and I hope and trust that that will stand them in good stead. Uh, and they are already having to uh, uh, arrest and detain people who claim they have uh, the coronavirus. As a, uh, and indeed, we have heard horrendous tales of shopkeepers being spat at or coughed over by people who think it's funny. People are frightened, but they should be frightened. And I hope, um, uh, Minister, that the message will go out. We have rightly concentrated on people who are most vulnerable and older people in particular. But I think many of us already know that there are children in intensive care across these islands who are, have also fallen uh, to this horrendous infection. Uh, and, and therefore, I would ask that the public health me messaging uh, be stepped up. 
The other um, query that has been raised with me, Mr Deputy Speaker, is from the private nursing home care providers in relation to testing and how uh, government and the private sector can best work together because we need the private uh, residential sector uh, to look after our older people and those with disabilities who cannot be cared for in their own home. And I would hope that uh, the Minister could give some reassurance uh, uh, to them. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, I, like many others, uh, wish our Minister for Health all the best. I know that people will be looking to political leaders, but as Paul Givens said earlier, there will be others who will also look to their religious and spiritual leaders, and I think we should also remember them today, that they too will be on the front line, particularly in those most difficult of circumstances when funerals are going to be restricted to two only, and all of the things that we hold dear will, will not uh, be there for us to hold on to in the, these most trying of times. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I call Jim Allister. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I want to begin by um, commending the Health Minister for his, the leadership he has shown and has given in this matter. It's good to have a steady hand on the tiller at this time. And, of course, he represents across our health service some of the most selfless, committed uh, individuals that keep this service going. And with others, I would want to pay a heartfelt tribute to them for all they have done and for all that they yet will have to do, because I suspect we don't know the half of it at this point. Uh, so to health service workers and to all who are keeping the machinery of government, and particularly of health, moving. A, a very big thank you. Some members have referred to this legislation that we're discussing as um, very draconian, and that's a, a fair enough description, although I suppose when you think of um, the individual that gives rise to that phrase, draconian, it, uh, Dracone was a leader in the 7th century BC in Athens who reached considerable notoriety for the very harsh penal codes that he imposed. And, uh, well, the, the, uh, not quite, uh, but the, um, the honourable member who interrupts from a senatory position, most surprising given his uh, august status in this House as a principal deputy speaker. I'm sure he's a well-read well gentleman who knows all about Dracon. Uh, but uh, he introduced various uh, penal codes, which for the most trivial of offences, as well as the most serious, uh, decreed that the penalty was death. Uh, so I don't think uh, we're, we're quite uh, as bad as that, but make no mistake about it, these are proposals which none of us as legislators should be at ease with, because these are stripping out rights and protections that all of us should value. Uh, yes? I'm grateful to the member for giving way. Earlier in the debate, I referred to the Special Powers Act. The member will recall the Special Powers Act was introduced in 1922 and was renewed every year that the old Northern Ireland Parliament sat. That being the case, does the member recognise there, there is an inherent danger? And I say this as a politician. That once politicians acquire power over people, they are often reluctant to return it to the people. I absolutely agree, and uh, to all intents and purposes, this is a special powers act, because uh, by its very essence, it is removing the norm, it is removing the hedge of protection that uh, is in place, and it is giving extraordinary powers of a summary nature to government. And Mike Nesbitt, in his speech, articulated some of those points very clearly. So none of us should shrug and say, uh, just let's do this. These are serious measures 
that have been taken. And indeed, it's notable in this legislation that the acts that can be taken by government have been placed at the lowest possible level in terms of how they can be taken. These matters are to be perfected by a statutory rules rather than statutory instruments. So a statutory rule can be made, as this House knows, very, very preemptively, uh, without effective scrutiny. There may be retrospective scrutiny, but there's no prospective scrutiny. Uh, and therefore, uh, the, the very powers that we're giving away, we're giving away at the cheapest possible price of mere uh, statutory rules. And we're doing it in legislation which not only can last for two years, which does seem to me longer than it needs to be at this point in time, but legislation which can be extended in six-month bites. So it isn't just a case that there is a cut-off point after two years. This is legislation which can be extended incrementally. And uh, uh, that can be done in Northern Ireland by a Northern Ireland department uh, taking these powers and extending them. So these are serious matters that we should not be meekly uh, accepting. And I do have to say something I referred to yesterday. I'm made even more uneasy about the exercise of these powers by virtue of the fact that simultaneously we have stripped out of this House many of the oversight scrutiny powers which we as MLAs had. I refer to the fact that yesterday, without debate, on a vote on the Nod, we removed from this House the right of MLAs to table oral or topical questions to any minister, to any minister, on any issue. And that coinciding with the very same moment that we're about to give those ministers the most extraordinary powers. And yet, instead of thinking that might be a time to amplify, to increase scrutiny, to add to the opportunity to question, we go in the very opposite direction. And as a House, we remove from MLAs the right to ask an oral question. And we actively discourage the asking of written questions. That, to me, Mr Deputy Speaker, is a House that's headed in the wrong direction in circumstances such as these. Yes? Is it not the case that um, parliamentary questions, whether being oral or written, are not just for the purposes of scrutiny, but also to inform the ministers of and highlight issues? I know, certainly from my perspective, when I ask assembly questions, I don't do it for an answer, I do it to raise an issue. And I think almost we are having suggestions that the Northern Ireland Executive intends to create a portal, almost reinventing the wheel of what Northern Ireland Assembly questions are intended for. So whilst I appreciate the, the concern around um, limiting questions because of the, the, the considerable amount of work that they, that they endure, um, is, is the Northern Ireland Executive uh, removing an opportunity to raise issues that those at the executive table might not find themselves on the ground? Uh, yes, I, I think the member makes a valid point. Um, very often the question is asked not so much with great expectation as to the answer, because sometimes the answers can be disappointing in just how opaque they are, uh, but in order to put the focus on an issue. And here we are heading into territory where we have bestowed on executive ministers, yes, in a time of great extremis, yes, in a time when it's necessary to give extra powers, but not at a time when it's necessary simultaneously to remove powers of scrutiny. And that is 
uh, my gripe about this matter, that we are coinciding the excessive increase, or no, I'll not say excessive, the, because much of it is necessary. The increase in powers to executive ministers, we're coinciding that with a time when we are surrendering and downgrading the right to ask questions in this House. And that of an executive, which I'm going to frankly say, a week ago, couldn't agree when our schools could be shut. An executive that was pulling in opposite directions. That is not a, the past few weeks in that regard was not a confidence building measure. And now, therefore, to see that we have bestowed upon those ministers, and we're effectively going to have, without question time, we're going to have government by press conference. Now, of course, it's necessary, it's right to keep the public fully informed, but this is an elected house for a purpose, and the purpose should be uh, that ministers convey through this house as much as they can to those we represent. Yes? The member for Given Way, but I want to bring some clarity, Mr Deputy Speaker, to what was agreed. Uh, I think uh, the uh, political party sought to act in a responsible way by freeing up ministers to deal with the crisis in hand. People are literally dying outside of here. And we wanted to ensure that ministers would be freed up by not having to answer lots of questions to raise issue. The health minister alone at that point had over 800 questions on his desk. And therefore, there was agreement reached, as uh, the members, uh, independent groups ought to know, that ministers gave a commitment from the executive to come before this House and make a statement to this House and answer as many questions as were needed. Uh, by members, so scrutiny will prevail, albeit uh, uh, in a different way. Well, the member makes a valiant effort to dress it up, but the reality is that a facility that existed for MLAs to ask the questions that were on their minds of ministers about actions they were taking in their departments has been stripped out and taken away. And in its place, we have the offer that ministers may, at their discretion, by and large, come to this House, make a statement and answer or dodge such questions as they wish. That is a very poor substitute, and it is not something that I believe needed to be done. The reference to 800 questions uh, to Minister Swan, <laughs> that was 800 questions of written form. We are talking about a minister coming to this House once every two or three weeks and ask, answering maybe half a dozen questions. That's what we're talking about in the scale of things. And yet that facility has been removed. And I simply make the point. I do not think that that in these circumstances is healthy uh, and it is not a step which should have been taken. But taken, it has been. Could I just uh, make a few miscellaneous points for the Minister's consideration. Under this bill, as I read it, uh, there are some, and somebody already referred to the fact that the, the powers are expressed pretty vaguely, uh, and maybe for a reason. But is there a power in this legislation to compel a factory, for example, to close? Now, I have had representations today from constituents of mine who are working in, in factories in my constituency and in the minister's constituency, who, by virtue of the sort of employment it is on an assembly line or on a production line, are effectively working shoulder by shoulder. Now, that makes a mockery of all we are told about social distancing. Uh, yet, what is the capacity to deal with that situation? Now, of course, it would be the ultimate extreme action to close such a factory. But if such, a, if such an extreme action was necessary, is the power within this bill to do it? 
or does it lie elsewhere, or does it fall within that clause about stopping gatherings uh, and closing premises? Does that extend to closing factories? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, uh, but it's the sort of vagueness that Mr Nesbitt was talking about uh, in his contribution. I think we need some clarity about issues like that. Where, Minister, does this legislation sit with the Civil Contingencies Act of 2004? Is there a crossover? Are we going to be relying on both? Because, of course, under it, there are also extraordinary powers that can be taken. Uh, I don't read this bill as superseding those. And are we going to see a mix and a match of those powers? Uh, and should it be made clear to the public that it's not just the powers that are in this bill, short to come and act, but also that which is in the Civil Contingencies Act. And um, if it comes to it, and things get as bad as is feared, are we going to be fettered in any way in calling in the necessary support of the army in this part of the United Kingdom? Is there going to be any fetter on that? There certainly shouldn't be, but is there? Can I ask the minister, if we get to a point where our hospitals, particularly in the border, are being overrun by people from outside the jurisdiction, anxious for help, are there steps we can or would or should take in that regard? Are there powers within this bill to allow the minister to act to deal with that extreme situation. Yes? Uh, I know the member likes to look for areas which may be provocative and cause tension, etc. That's a stay. But is, is he seriously suggesting we should stop cross-border health care? What if patients from South Armagh or South Down or Derry or whatever go across the border seeking health care? Are you suggesting that if we block the border, that the southern authorities should block you their side of the border. Surely what he should be seeking at this time is cross-border cooperation in our health care and looking after our loved ones, rather than trying to create a problem which should be a solution. I don't think I'm trying to create a problem. I'm asking what I think is a legitimate question. If we should, in the extreme of this situation, arise at a point where the National Health Service facilities in this part of, uh, of the United Kingdom are put beyond breaking point because of an influx from outside this jurisdiction, is it not a fair and legitimate question to ask, does the minister have the powers to deal with that situation and to remedy that situation. I think he should. Uh, but the member thinks he shouldn't. Well, then maybe it is he who's letting his politics override his judgment. Yes. Call. I think it was in 2001, uh, the outbreak of foot and mouth that took place in Northern Ireland. And on that occasion, the army was deployed to help deliver essential supplies. At that time, I think we had uh, a government up and running at Stormont that included all parties. So there's no legitimate reason why people could object. Yep. Uh, the uh, member, I think, is right in what he says. And, uh, you know, I don't see this as a green and orange issue. This virus is colourless as far as that is concerned. But it does concern me somewhat that. In recent weeks, it was the greenery of some people's view that led their thinking about the schools needing to close. Because it had been done south of the border, it had to be done north of the border. I think it was those people who were allowing their politics to rule their head in this matter. And will that same politics rule their head if it comes to the need for army support? That is a legitimate question to which we need an answer from those who want to uh, make politics 
out of this situation. Let them tell us. If it comes to it, and we need army support in this province to get through this crisis, are they going to stand behind that and support that? Or is that trumped by their politics? You know, there's no time for that, and I trust that won't be the situation. I'll leave it there. I call Jerry Carl. Hey, speaker, and I want to begin by giving my thoughts um, to everybody who's been forced to self-isolate, um, and especially those people who uh, don't have family or friends to call uh, and are self-isolating. Uh, my thoughts are with them uh, at this time, and I want to extend my condolences as well to everybody who have um, tragically lost their lives as a result of this um, deadly, dangerous virus. Mr. Speaker. Uh, I'm, I'm incredibly frustrated that, once again, this executive uh, has had to wait for Boris Johnson to act when international advice was to take action. Two weeks ago, the World Health Organization criticised Boris Johnson's do-nothing herd immunity approach, and when Europe was dubbed the epicentre of the pandemic, Boris Johnson did not want to act, so the executive uh, didn't. It's worth remembering uh, the executive refused to close schools, despite uh, the, the fact that all around us, schools and workplaces uh, were closing their doors in the interest of public health. They were miles ahead uh, in terms of taking action. And it's worth remembering as well that the Minister of Education snarled at me last week, this day last week, when I suggested that schools uh, should be closed down. It has taken two weeks of public outrage, of international criticism, of pressure from NH NHS staff to get us toward a more serious shut shutdown, <clears throat> and, still, and still there are not enough measures in place to protect the vulnerable from COVID-19. I wonder, could the Health Minister tell us why we are still refusing to test people in their hundreds and thousands? Stray through testing centres are being set up in the South, but someone with two or more symptoms here uh, cannot get a test. It simply boggles the mind. I wonder also, could the minister uh, tell me why the executive has not moved to requisition private health care facilities and equipment into public use to resolve the shortages in the health service? A company outside Belfast, I'm sure as people will know, uh, are charging £120 for a testing kit, and another uh, in the south sells ventilators uh, internationally, but we have shortages uh, across this island. Where is the effort to take over production of personal protective equipment? to make sure our health service is properly protected. Uh, profit shouldn't trump public health at any time, but especially at this time. And finally, were the, uh, the way ranging financial measures to protect those who have lost their jobs or will be unable to support themselves because of this virus. Five weeks on universal credit waiting list or basic statutory pay, uh, neither is good enough. Rent freezes, mortgage freezes, ban on evictions, utility bills being frozen. These are the real emergency powers that should be enacted. Instead of taking these steps, this executive is quickly moving to emergency powers to simply force people indoors. Mr. Speaker, we and people before profit will happily back the progressive proposals within this bill, for example, to recruit uh, to the health service. But this legislation does not include real measures which would protect workers, the self-employed and the vulnerable, and this has been a problem all along. Indeed, much of this legislation seems to be primarily aimed at coercing people instead of providing the financial provisions to allow people to stay at home. And I share the concerns of Amnesty International in, in relation to this legislation, Mr. Speaker, who have said that they are, and I quote, broad, serious, and potentially invasive powers granted to public health officials, constables, and immigration officers, end quote. In the short time that we had uh, to look at this legislation, I attempted to amend uh, this legislation to reduce many of these elements because we think it's wrong to potentially detain people when employers are still able to force people to go to work. And in my experience, Mr. Speaker, people want to socially distance them themselves and socially isolate to protect their themselves and their families. But we urgently need financial security from government for those people and not simply state coercion. Powers such as attainment should never be considered before financial security has been secured. And how can the executive contemplate detaining people if they haven't even secured provisions that would allow thousands of construction workers to stay at home, or agency workers, or the self-employed, uh, for that matter? 
And further, these emergency powers would potentially be conferred for two years, a massively draconian shift which we attempted to amend, so that this Assembly would have to ratify these measures every two months. Basic accountability to ensure extreme measures would not remain in place longer than they absolutely had to. And I think it is regrettable, it's deeply problematic, Mr. Speaker, that those amendments did not make it to the floor today. And I would urge the Executive to bring these powers back. Uh, for regular ratification to the floor of this Assembly to ensure oversight against any potential uh, abuses of power. If we ask, Mr. can we look at these powers every few months, why can't we? And that's something uh, that I think other members have raised already uh, today. And in order to ease uh, some concerns in relation to the detention aspects in this bill, I want to specifically ask the Health Minister uh, that he make a, a public statement uh, declaring that his department will not pass on the details of any migrants to the Home Office during the crisis, in line with the recent Irish Government statement uh, to that uh, effect, a similar statement by the Government in the South, and also that staff receive guidance, updates uh, to confirm asylum seekers and those without status here are able to access free health care in relation to COVID-19. And if he does so, uh, I'm sure it will provide some important assurances to those members of our community who are vulnerable uh, and often marginalised. Finally, Mr. Speaker, I want to take this opportunity to pay tribute uh, to and thank the incredible, brave, compassionate workers in our frontline services. We will be forever indebted uh, to them for putting themselves uh, and their families second and the health of our communities first. We cannot thank you enough, and I only hope the importance of your work is never again rewarded with lesser wages and conditions that you do not deserve. Thank you. I call Claire Sugden. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Um, I would like to begin by thanking the Minister for his work. I remember um, saying at Restoration Day that he had the hardest job of all. I don't think anyone, even him, anticipated how true that would be a mere few months later. Minister, genuinely, I am impressed by your candour, your professionalism and your compassion for all of the people in Northern Ireland. I would extend those similar comments to the wider Northern Ireland executive it's about people, not politics, finally. I recognise that people are scared. They're confused, fearful for their health and the health of their families. People have died contracting COVID-19. And I offer my sincere condolences to family and friends of those who have passed. My thoughts are also with those who are receiving uh, health care for any illness in all health and social care settings across Northern Ireland, the UK and indeed the world. The circumstances in which we anticipate place them in the most vulnerable position and I expect they are very scared right now. To all those on the front line, health and social care staff, police, the prison service, pharmacies, retail staff and all those now working not for themselves but for others. You have my support, compassion, and representation. Whatever I can do, I will. And I'm sure we will, as has been apparent today. To an extent, the agreement of this legislative consent motion is academic. And I'm saying that not to undermine the genuine concerns that have been raised by many, not least Mr. Nesbitt, Mr. Alistair, and Ms. Woods, that in normal circumstances would be entirely valid and would render probably this bill unacceptable. But I said to acknowledge how serious this situation is. If we are abandoning democracy, we are doing it for survival. And I do appreciate the comments of Ms Kelly around removing the burden of the Assembly questions from the ministers. Um, again, I will reiterate, I don't seek to put on any undue burden to an already overwhelmed Northern Ireland executive. But I do seek to raise those queries that I do feel will be lost. I'm sure every member in this House has received considerable correspondence via social media, via email, via telephone. I go to bed at two in the morning and I wake up at seven and those messages are unanswered. And I think the, the, the forum, the, the channel of assembly questions is a good opportunity not to expect answers, 
but to raise queries to ensure that maybe some issues that may have been overlooked are being addressed. Because when we do that, the people that we resept, uh, represent, all of us, including the Northern Ireland Executive, will benefit. This isn't normal, and I sincerely hope that it doesn't become our new normal. When this passes, and you know, I think we're all praying to God and whoever else you know, we, we put our hope in that it will, there does need to be global work to understand why this has happened and how we can prevent it happening again. So I suppose I'm going to use this opportunity not necessarily to debate the uh, specific clauses within this bill and legislative consent motion. If anything, I want to use this as an opportunity to seek clarity or at minimum raise issues to ensure that they're not overlooked and that people will not through the, fall through the gaps in the chaos of survival. Um, I will, however, Mr Deputy Speaker, try and keep it in line um, uh, with, the, with the, the parts of this bill. The practical outworkings of this bill are ambiguous. Even after the Prime Minister's statement last night, perhaps even more ambiguous than they were before. One of the, the, the key areas that I do want to talk about is statutory sick pay, and I know it's provided for in this bill. I really appreciate the removal of the three-day wait. People should not be financially disadvantaged by these circumstances. Statutory sick pay, as many members will know, is typically paid up front by the employer on day four. And I will expect that employers will also empl uh, pay employees on days one, two and three directly. So I would ask the Minister, and maybe he can come back to me if he's unable to answer today, does the coronavirus bill provide a mechanism in which employers can claim the additional three days of statutory, sick pay, uh, statutory sick pay that this bill will enact? How soon will this be reimbursed? And I appreciate this is a short-term financial uh, burden on the employer, but short-term cash flow is the problem which can lead, has led, to many employers making serious decisions which has disrupted their business and disrupted the lives of their employees and may never recover from. Also regarding statutory sick pay, I've been con contacted by a number of employees last night and this morning telling me that their employ employer is requesting a sick note or self-certification to enable them to stay at home. And this is again after the PM's announcement last night. Previous UK Gov did, uh, advice did say that this isn't required, but it does seem that there remains considerable confusion about the liability of allowing people to stay at home. And I'll go into this further. If the employee themselves makes a decision to self-isolate, are they only entitled to statutory sick pay as per their uh, contract of employment? If the employer makes the decision to send staff home, is he or she liable to pay full pay while not receiving income at the other end? If the government, as we have heard last night, instructs businesses to close, then are they taking on the liability to pay workers? And how are they doing that? Who gets minimum statutory sick pay? Who is going to be entitled to the coronavirus job retention scheme, which pays up to 80% of, of wages? Do we advise them to go on to new style job seekers allowance, which isn't means tested on savings and partners' income, or the, the sickness benefit of ESA, which is quite similar? Or do we tell them to go on to universal credit, which they may not be applicable for anyway, again, depending on their financial circumstance of savings and partners' income? Minister, I'm, I'm telling you all this, and I appreciate it's not entirely your remit, but you're, I suppose you're responding to a lot of the concerns in relation to this more widely, and I do appreciate you for doing that. Um, we nearly need the whole executive here because we could talk about every issue that, that seems to come up with this bill. But it is this confusion that is leading people to continue to work and, re and employers reluctantly making them stay. And where you do have a concern is that this will not delay the spread, and that's where we are right now. Another area of concern is on essential workers. If employers who have been forced to close further to announcements this week and last night will be able to access the coronavirus job retention scheme on behalf of these workers. That's fantastic. It has removed uncertainty for them who are nervous about their own health and for the health of their families. I welcome this and I do look forward to more measures specifically regarding the self-employed, which we're hopeful may come today. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, however, the devil is in the detail, and I appreciate the bill in itself may not uh, provide that. But we have to be concerned about the outworkings of this bill that we are uh, passing, I suppose, via this House and all the other devolved regions, but specifically in Westminster. I'm finding the really fast-moving pace, as I expect all, all uh, members are, as well as ministers, making it incredibly difficult to provide good advice to our constituents. Where I'm finding it particularly difficult is to cross-reference that information with standard employment law, with other uh, uh, law, laws that, that, that are in place. Things are not clear. Many members have said it, but I, I think the point needs to be well made, because that's where the correspondence from my constituents is coming from. It's leading to further anxiety, and again, it is leading people to make decisions about their work and their income. So what is essential? I know some have described it as key workers and those employees that support those key workers. I was contacted by a tyre centre for motor vehicles this morning. Not really an essential service, or is it? What if a nurse, a doctor, or a teacher who's looking after key workers gets a flat tyre where do they go so that they continue to travel to their place of work where they are saving lives? It becomes essential at that point. Off sales. Now, I really wouldn't consider this uh, an essential retail. However, I do understand at this stage why many might disagree with me. Um, but they themselves have not been given any direction. You know, and I think if we come back to the crux of why the Prime Minister had to make this announcement, it was the purpose of them trying to limit people in close proximity, again to delay the spread. Yep, please go ahead. I'm glad she had the courage to raise the, the question of off-sales, and I agree with her that m more clarity is needed. Would she also agree that it's particularly important, though no one, I think, in this chamber would responsibly describe on off-sales as an essential service, that there is also the danger of, in these unique circumstances, creating a kind of black market, and that it's important that people have clear guidance on what is and isn't permissible, so that people know both customers and business owners know how to operate within the law. Entirely, and I think that the lack of detail and the clarity is, is, is where we are going to find ourselves within difficulty. And again, with people taking the risk that they will remain in their employment um, and, and potentially spreading uh, the, the virus, and that's where we don't want to get to. Sometimes I get frustrated that the message around delaying spread isn't um, made clear entirely. Forgive me for saying this, but I know the Minister himself has said this many times. I think it is inevitable that we will all you know, contract this virus at some stage. But the difficulty is, is that if we all contract it at once, therefore putting overwhelming pressure on the health service all at, want, uh, all at once, which then limits their ability to look after the most sick and the most vulnerable. And when, when their ability is limited, that's when people will die. But to come back to my point about off-sales, the Prime Minister, I suppose, ultimately uh, made his announcement in relation to limiting close proximity. And close proximity can be controlled off, uh, in off-sales in the same way that it can be controlled in supermarkets. So do they remain open? And if they can stay open, will their employees be able to access the coronavirus job retention scheme? Or will staff who want to self-isolate, understandably, be reduced to statutory sick pay, depending again on their employment contract, as per my earlier point? Now, I, I'm genuinely not trying to advocate for off-sales to remain open. Um, but they are going to work tonight, Minister. Gardeners are asking me if they can cut lawns because they're outside. They are not uh, interacting with the people that, that they, they work for. Um, but then we're telling family members that they can't come to each other's properties and premises. So I do think a lot of this advice is really unclear. And whether you can or you can't, ultimately, no one wants to be at work. We're in a situation now where we want to be at home with the people that we live with, with to limit the spread as much as possible. But if they can only access statutory sick pay instead of the 80% uh, wages, then maybe they will make a choice to go to work. It's easy for me to say, if in doubt, don't go to work. 
But in doing so, they may not have enough money to put food on their table, they may be at risk of defaulting bills, and they may face legal action. I have a constituent who last week contacted me because they had received an, enforce, uh, an intention to enforce repossession on their home that was sent last week from the Northern Ireland Court and Tribunal Service on behalf of their mortgage uh, lender. Has this been thought about? Have we thought about the impact of standard correspondence which is triggered when people miss however many payments within their mortgage contract, which has the potential to deeply unsettle in a context where good mental health is already being challenged? Skilled workers. We are hearing um, services are being reduced, and I fully, fully understand the rationale of this um, to enable delay to the spread. But, Minister, in some circumstances, are we limiting our response of the next phase by our actions within the delay phase? And let me qualify this. For example, licensing has been suspended. But will this include ambulance workers needed in the weeks ahead? Will this include HGV drivers, which I understand we have a considerable shortage of anyway? Mr Speaker, I don't expect all the details of this to be worked out. I think the, the fast-moving pace of this inevitably means that things will be lost which again, it means that I, I do see the necessity of my earlier point to be able to uh, correspond this to ministers. Um, and I have no way to do that now. If, if anything, I'm chasing down their special advisors, I'm writing to the private office, and my method of keeping them informed is much more convoluted, much more resource intensive than submitting an assembly question, which quite frankly, I don't care if you answer. I just want you to know. I would make the point again, I made it when I was Minister, I'll make it now. The purpose of this Assembly is to scrutinise, and it's to do it on the basis, not necessarily to hold the government to account, but that is our role. That's democracy, ladies and gentlemen. But it's also there to support Ministers in their work. And we do that to, help, to inform them, to be the representatives of the 100,000 constituents of East Londonderry and all the various constituencies across Northern Ireland. And it's that representation role that informs them for the job that they have to do, which is right. So I would very much implore ministers to look towards their MLAs. We're here to support you and find out the bits of the legislation that you may have overlooked, the policy that might have unintended consequences. Yep, yeah, sure, go ahead. Forgive me, an, an honour point about unintended consequences. I've been contacted today by constituents who fear for the life of their elderly that are in care homes and nursery homes across this country. Some that are incapacitated in such a way that it is their loved ones that visit them in these homes who they really rely on in this time. We've seen reports in Spain on the recent BBC News that have suggested uh, a higher number of uh, elderly that have now become vulnerable in care homes and have passed away, sadly, because they've not been provided with the appropriate care. Now, while it has been rightly pointed out that many that work in our care homes are, are professionals and are unsung heroes at this time, but sadly, as we have seen in Northern Ireland in the past, that is not always the case. So we have loved ones that, that really want to visit their elderly relatives that they sense are in real danger, but are unable to do so at this time because, again, we have a message of is it safe to go? Some homes have applied a blanket ban, others have not, but there's no clarity. They desperately need clarity in this time, and it's important that we as MLAs can relay that back to ministers at a time like this. Can I encourage members to be brief in their interventions, and they, can add their, they could add their name to, to the speaking list if, if they wish. Uh, and I call on Claire Sutton again. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I think the point is entirely well made, and I think every member has, has, has mentioned it within their contributions. The need for information is critical right now. When the general public are concerned, when they're anxious, we provide them from information to reassure. Again, it's not entirely a criticism because I do understand how fast-paced this is. Um, I do understand that the resources within the Northern Ireland Civil Service are limited. We had a VES scheme which took out a good part of our experience. It took out a lot of our resource. And ultimately, that's why Northern Ireland has stopped its assembly asking questions when the other regions haven't, because our resource here is limited. We are into this maybe a month after three years without um, an assembly. The Secretariat, the, the, the Northern Ireland Civil Service, was run down. They were redeployed elsewhere. 
I suppose we, we are where we are, and we need to try and put our best foot forward in trying to help the people of Northern Ireland and trying to save lives. But let us help you. Don't be that executive that sits behind closed doors and gets nervous about the input of the MLAs that hold you to account. The legislature, which you are members of as well, let's take their advice, their experience of casework, the, 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 the comments that they're getting um, on the ground, and let's see how we can make this work for everyone so that we do limit the worst effects of this uh, virus. Minister, I really could stand here all day and go through every department and talk about the various remit, about the things that we haven't considered. But your time is so much more precious than mine. But I want us to all spare thought, maybe more than that, because I think we're at that, for all those hundreds of thousands of people that are stranded outside of the UK and Ireland and can't get home, whilst waiting to contribute, I have had messages from Bali, I've had messages from Australia, I've had messages from Turkey, I'm aware of an issue in Peru, and they are telling me that there are hundreds of thousands of Britons stranded abroad, and my concern for them is, you know, where do they go? Do they have shelter? Do they have food? Do they have access to the rights that we enjoy here that they don't in the places that they are visiting? And I can't stress strongly enough that whether they are here or abroad, they are our responsibility if they are the constituents of Northern Ireland. I have limited power or influence on the UK government, and I appreciate that you know, the, the, the Foreign Office that falls within the remit of Westminster. But we do have an influence collectively as an assembly, collectively as a Northern Ireland executive. You attend those COBRA meetings. What are we doing about our people abroad? Because that is a concern. If we are anticipating that this will go on longer than a month, maybe three months, four months, what are we doing to try and get our people home? Maybe it's not a priority right now, and I accept that, and hard decisions are having to be made. We heard that yesterday uh, when Mr. Alistair talked about his very tragic uh, constituent. And, but I do think it has to be a consideration. There is much our responsibility as anything else. Um, I wish Minister you well. I wish this Assembly well, because I myself see the work that we are doing um, to, to try and represent and put forward the views of our constituents and indeed assist and advocate on their behalf. It will be a really difficult weeks, months ahead, but we will come out the other end. And I think that's what we have to look forward to. That's what I'm trying to encourage my constituents to look forward to. Thank you. I now call on the Minister of Health, uh, Robin Swan, to conclude and wind up the debate on the motion and the amendment. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and can I honestly thank the members of this House for their, their contributions. But I want also to thank them all for the, the acknowledgement they've paid to, to my staff and the health and social care staff, domiciliary staff, pharmacists, doctors, GPs all those across Northern Ireland who are working to, I think, what it was Mr. Jim Allister said, not just for what we're, where we are now, but what is still to face us. And I think, as members, that's when we will look to your assistance and help um, in the future in your understanding. Um, just to, to update members while we were away there, there has been a lot of issues raised in regards to, to PPE, um, just to make members um, fully aware. Earlier on today, I've authorised the release of 30% of our pandemic stockpile. It's probably earlier than we wished we could have, but because of, I suppose, the concerns that have been raised. But the additional pressure now comes on those within the trust, within the GPs, with every other facility, to make sure that that PPE is managed wisely, because that's the challenge at this minute in time. And it's a challenge that I can't manage. It's a challenge that my tar department can't manage on that social, on that low or that level of the front line. So there's a responsibility there. And folks, I, I stood here a fortnight ago and I said about how sanitizer was being stolen from our hospitals. Folks, face masks are being stolen from our, from our emergency departments. 
So the pressure may be on us as a department, as a trust, to make sure that the PPE is there and is available. But there's also a responsibility on the wider public to make sure that it's available for those who need it when they need it. Um, in regards to the contributions um, today, and members, if you indulge me, I want to cover as many of them as I can because I am one of those ministers who has stopped assembly questions or stopped answering them because simply we had reaching nearly 800. Um, and members, if someone looked at some of those questions today, in hindsight, they'd wonder were they really worthwhile asking. And if some people from the outside this house looked at some of those questions, they would actually ask why were they ever asked in the first place. So in regards to the contributions, um, and, and I'll start with, with the Deputy Chair, um, of, of the committee um, raised a number of issues in regards to the well-being and deployment of students and retirees, and that was raised by a number of members. I can assure members that those students, retirees, and, and indeed the volunteers that we're asking for, which will be empowered under this bill, under the VEF scheme, will have the necessary training and support, and that their health and safety is paramount. Whilst these measures are being progressed urgently, essential processes for recruitment are still taking place, but, but much faster. And in regards to where they'll, they'll be deployed, these staff will be deployed as operational needs required, making sure that we have a balance in the need that's there, but also matched up with the skills and the experience of, of the level of, of the people who are, are, are supplying them. Um, the Deputy Chair also asked in regards to the indemnity for health and social care activity. Um, health and the provision of clinical neg negligence indemnity to healthcare workers and others carrying out NX NHS activities is a devolved matter. Um, so Clause 12 provides powers to provide indemnity for clinical negligence liabilities arising from HSC activities carried out for the purpose of dealing with it or in consequence of the coronavirus outbreak where there is no existing indemnity arrangement already um, in place. Um, the Deputy Chair also asked in regards to the sectors where employees um, can absence themselves in regards for the emergency volunteers. This actually covers employees and workers who are engaged in COVID-19 volunteer activity. So it does include agency workers, uh, and those eligible will receive compensation for the loss of earnings and travel expenses. Uh, and the, this, the, the scheme has actually been designed on a UK-wide basis. But in regards to how we actually manage some of our other volunteers coming forward, I spoke with the, the Minister of Communities this morning and she's engaging as to how we manage that. Because this is an executive-wide approach. Although I'm leading on this bill today, it's because it is, is, is health-based, it is health-grounded. The response to this is across the executive. Um, in regards to the chair also, or the, the deputy chair also raised the, the issue in regards to volunteering leave. Emergency volunteer leave will create temporary unpaid statutory rights for eligible employees and workers so they can take emergency volunteer leave. It's a day one right for employees and workers and it'll be up for a period of 16 weeks. An employee or worker may only take only one period of um, emergency volunteer leave in any volunteering period, and that must be in a block of two, three, four weeks. So it's fair on their employer as well, and because if they're taking up a volunteering space within within the health and social care system, it's actually so it's providing value as well. Um, moving on then um, to uh, John O'Dowd raised a number of questions um, in regards to, and I think it was a valid point. Be under no illusion we will lose businesses and we will lose jobs. But my aim as Minister of Health is to lose as few lives as possible. Because that's where our focus must be and should be at all times. He said life would go back to normal. Folks, I don't see the normal going back to what we perceived it to be. There'll be a new normal. We look at life differently. We look at society differently because, be under no illusion, this will have a profound effect on how we respond to society afterwards. He also asked in regards to the, the rationale for, for the amendment that I, uh, I moved this morning. Um, the amendment to the legisla legislative uh, consent motion was simply an amendment to capture some last minute amendments um, to the bill. 
and to make sure that these provisions were included in the bill and they were raised by, by the Department of Communities uh, to refer to district, district council meetings, business improvement districts, statutory sick pay and commercial leases and business tenancies. So that was the reason for the amendment, to make sure that we captured within this bill um, what, what, we, what we could. In regards to the, the chair of the TEO, and, and I think, again, I, I just want to reinforce um, that in the House, and what the, there are a number of chairs and vice chairs of various committees raised. The contents of this bill cover the executive office, economy, communities, justice, DERA, education, health, all have input into this bill. Um, I got the, the privilege and honour to lead it because COVID-19 is seen as, as a health, health matter. Um, so in regards to the, the point that many members have made um, in regards to the six-month clause, uh, a new clause for six-month review has been added, and this allows for the House of Commons to express a view on the continued operation of the legislation, and the review clause does not apply to the temporary measures um, that are actually being devolved. But what I would say to members of this House, as Health Minister, for the parts of this bill that are within my remit and within the function and action of my department, I will come back here and give you regular updates. I have committed to do that as Minister. I am not, I'm, I'm, I'm not adverse to, to taking the criticism of this House, should it be constructive or otherwise. I have been here too long to, to let this issue get, get to me. To pers well, it does get to me personally, but to, the challenge of members in this House get to me. Uh, in regards to the, the Chair of the Executive Office, he also asked in, 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 in regards to pension for retired, uh, retired returnees and the recon reconfiguration to be temporary. Uh, the Pensions Clause of 45 exists to remove any pension restrictions as an obstacle, so that has already been covered in the bill and it is open for something that we actually can, we can do as, as we need to deploy. Um, in regards to I, I think it was uh, the, the enforcement advice uh, on, on what can be closed. As I said earlier, the bill provides for enforcement of the measures of closing premises and prohibiting gatherings. So it's very important the social distancing measures. So these measures are, and enforcement powers focus on owners and occupiers of premises and organisers of event. They do not target individual people, however foolish they may be, who choose to ignore advice and attend events. Members, I recognise that this may not be enough if individual people do not heed the instruction and continue to behave in a way that puts their own health and that of others at risk. So, if additional measures are needed, such as fixed penalty notices to deal with individuals who behave irresponsibly, then, with the agreement of my executive colleagues, we will not hesitate um, to introduce them. In regards to I think the contribution then from, from other members, uh, from my own party leader, leader um, Steve Egan, he said, as we face this crisis, it will bring out the best of us. Folks, I hope it also shames the worst of us, who cannot see that their selfish actions today, yesterday and tomorrow will cost lives. They will put pressure on our health service that will see it not being able to cope. And I think John O'Dowd's uh, contribution in regards to that, that, that depiction of someone who is irresponsible today not being able to be beside a loved one because they suffer from the severe ravages of what COVID-19 will bring. Um, in regards to, to Paula Bradshaw's contribution, um, she referred to those within the community and the volunteers who are stepping up. Folks, we can't allow that spirit of volunteering, that spirit of contribution to be in vain, or we can't fail them and being able to support them to be able to do that. She also mentioned in regards to challenges, and I think Matthew Till raised it as well. Folks, this bill will cause us to look at death in a very different way over the next few months. For what is the normal tradition from either side of this house, across all sides, of that of a wake, of visiting the house, of putting a friendly hand of comfort or a hug out to someone who has bereaved, is now no longer 
advisable or acceptable. Because that friendly hand of comfort, that hug of comfort, could add another life, the loss of another life or another death. So, folks, this is going to be tough. We're in a tough few months. Um, but we will see the other side. But if we don't listen to the advice that's been given, if we don't follow the guidance that's in this bill, not all of us will see the other side. And that's as basic and as blunt as a message as I can give. Um, the Chair of the Justice uh, Committee, Paul Given, made a number of comments, and you know, I was fortunate that my, my executive colleague, uh, the Justice Minister, actually addressed some of her concerns, or some of the, her, her relevant parts in this bill yesterday. Um, if the executive needs to add additional legislation, um, it can. Uh, we can also supplement what's in this bill by, by regulations as well. So there is, there, there is an ability um, to do that. The, the chair of the Justice Committee also um, touched again on the human side of what COVID-19 means to each of us as MLAs, where it reaches out and hits what will hit a family will react to a family or how a family actually reacts to how we challenge this. In regards to social distancing and the word he used, that you know, people seem to be in ignorance or just not wanting to, to comply with the guidance we were given, those people may feel that they are immune because they're young. The statistics in Northern Ireland show at this moment in time, and Steve Egan referred to them, over a third of those tested positive for COVID-19 in Northern Ireland at this moment in time are under 40. The next third falls in that 44 to, to 65 age bracket, and the other, the other third are above that. So this isn't a virus that respects age. But for those young people who think they are immune, you will not be immune to the effects of some of the actions in this bill, nor will your loved ones be able to bask in your immunity from what you think is COVID-19. Because that's what the challenge to social distancing is actually about, to stop that spread within homes, within, within workplaces and within our, 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 our general society. And I will thank him for his prayers, um, because folks, for those, and there's many in Northern Ireland who rely on them and look to them at this moment in time, they are valued no matter what they are. And if you are in your place of worship, if you, I think it was Dave Allen said, if you have any God or no God, folks, say a prayer of thanks tonight for our health service and the work that they're doing. For the chair um, to the economy, she spoke of, um, spoke of the, the volunteer register. Um, again, I, I spoke to your colleague uh, this morning, uh, the Minister of Communities, because communities are leading in that. She also queried in regards to, to Article 36. Yes, it will only be used if, if it's needed, if we have to compel colleges, schools or childcare to actually open up to support um, the children of key workers, because it's those key workers that are keeping our health service running. Um, from the Chair of, of the Environment and Agriculture and Rural Affairs Committee, he spoke of organisations, the GAA, Young Farmers Clubs of Ulster, and the support that they can give. It's also the support that they can give at this minute in time in preparing to support those in our community. Those um, who are facing isolation, but without the family that many of us, or most of us, can rely on in here. So those who are socially isolated and distant within rural communities. Because what we're trying to do here in the steps and measures that we're taking, we don't want to isolate people from society. We want to shield them from this virus. There's a big difference, and there's a responsibility that all other organisations can take in supporting them that. Um, in regards to Patsy McLuhan made contributions in regards to health workers um, being a key group. Patsy, 100%. The more tests that we can get in place, and we raised, we've raised them now to 1,100 this morning. Now, I've taken criticism, as, as soon as I mentioned it this morning, I've taken criticism, criticism across this House that it's not enough. It's not enough. That's why we're pushing on. Three weeks ago, we were doing 32. We're now at 1,100. And that 
push continues to do more tests so that we can make sure that we can get our frontline staff back and work on as soon as possible and support their families, but also support the other groups that are there as well. And that's the groups who, who are vulnerable in our hospitals so that we make sure we're not, we're not treating non-COVID patients beside COVID patients, so we're not putting additional strain on our hospital facilities. So that if we, we find a case in a, in a care home or a, a severe educational learning disability facility, that we're not cohorting all those people together. So if we find one case, we can, we can test everyone around them. So we're focusing those tests as our capability increases, as it will, We'll target out and reach out to those who, who can who can use it. Um, Pansy, uh, you asked will the public uh, powers available to the public health agency be extended to environmental health officers and district councils? Um, the public health regulation making powers under clause 46 and schedule 17 of the bill can confer functions on the public health agency or other bodies or persons to help support the public health response of COVID-19. So yes, they can be. The powers relating to potentially infectious persons, which is in Schedule 20, allow the Director of Public Health and the Public Health Agency to advise or direct others under arrangements to prevent or control the spread of coronavirus. So it's about how you actually deal and make sure we're using those people um, to the best of their, their ability and their skill set as well. In regards to support for people subject to early release um, from prison, my officials are working to ensure that um, mental health support is there for anyone who is suffering from mental health, health um, during this difficult time, and that support will include include an increased online resource, as you know, as undoubtedly our, our workers in this area will will fall fall victim to this virus as well. So, in regards to what we're doing as well, in regards to mental health, it's also a major part of what my department does, but it's also supporting the other work we do and asking people to to socially isolate. Um, in regards then, the Vice Chair of, of the Education Committee um, quoted Heaney, uh, we will wonder this out. Folks, if we can get through to society to follow this guidance, to listen to the simple advices, there will be more of us. We will see the summer. It is as simple as that. So Heaney's guidance was right. But we have to follow the guidance and the regulations and the direction that's coming from the Department of Health um, as well. Um, Mr. Nesbitt, Mike Nesbitt, then made uh, an, or asked an, a number of questions in regards to the prohibition of events as a building site, a gathering, for example. Um, it's not in the intention or the policy intent behind behind the clause for public events, but it is something that I know that my executive colleagues and and TEO are looking at. Um, the legislation in relation to powers relating to events, gatherings and premises in Nor Northern Ireland actually enables TEO to give directions, but before so the TEO must have regard to any relevant advice published by the CMO or any deputy CMO of the Department of Health, and the TEO must consult with CMO before making the same. So before making the dec declaration of the risks of CV and NI, and coronavirus in Northern Ireland so as to enable the activation of powers relating to potentially infectious persons in Northern Ireland, the Department of Health must consult the CMO, and such declaration by the Department of Health must actually be published online and in the Belfast Gazette. So that, I think that was one of the, the clarities or reassurances the member was, was actually looking for. Um, in regards to the contribution from uh, Martina Anderson, I think um, the message that she, she, she put forward in regards to that joint office and the perception of the joint office of our first and deputy first minister now, as they deliver the messages to the people of Northern Ireland, cannot be underestimated because it shows the unity of purpose that that the executive has at this minute in time in challenge of the coronavirus bill. She also raised a number of um, issues in regards to the human rights effect of this bill. Um, folks, the front of the bill carries the declaration on the European Convention of Human Rights, and the Secretary Matt Hancock has made the following statement under Section 19.1a of the Human Rights Act 1998. So, in my view, the provisions of the coronavirus bill are compatible with the Convention rights. That's similar and akin to declarations that are made 
and legislation here, any piece of legislation that we're moving in Northern Ireland. Um, Martina Anderson and Matthew Till also raised um, why do immigration officers need these powers and what will the powers allow an immigration officer to actually do. And I think it was the, over the concerns of the powers of um, immigration officers. The powers ensure that immigration officers can support the wider public health effort where they encounter a person who is or may be infectious during the course of their normal functions at the border or while exercising immigration enforcement functions in country. These proposed powers will allow an immigration officer to direct or remove such a person to a suitable place for the purpose of screening or assessment or to keep that person there for a suitable place for a time limited period to be handed over to the relevant health authorities. That time limited period is up to three hours, but it can only be extended by a further nine hours. So immigration officers are required to consult a public health officer to the extent that it is practicable before actually exercising those powers. Um, Justin McNulty then talked about uh, how this role was, was pressurised, but as I said last week uh, or the week before, that it's also a privilege. It's an honour to hold this role at this minute in time and represent an untiring and unrelentless and a dedicated workforce. Um, in regards to how I see health in this country at this minute in time, folks' health is more than a sound bite. Health is actually more than a headline to be chased. Because at this minute in time, our health service means life itself for so many of our constituents. So let's not get distracted about what health could be doing, what health can be doing. Health at this minute in time is doing everything that we can possibly do. Matthew Till also raised the issue that it was time to be honest. Folks, since I took up this role when coronavirus and COVID-19 hit Northern Ireland, that's all I can do. Because I've been blunt, I've been frank, and at times I've probably went farther than some would have wished me to do in my public messaging. But folk, to, get, to get the message home that 14 to 15,000 people in Northern Ireland could die if others don't take their responsibilities seriously is a message that I cannot ramp home hard enough. And now is the time for people to act. In regards to, to the contribution from, from Rachel Woods, um, Rachel, you, your questions are well made. Um, in regards to how we, we look after our homeless, how we look after the vulnerable, um, it's work that is ongoing, probably not fast enough. Because what was actually said to me in a passing comment the other night, when Belfast became so depleted of normal shoppers, normal people, the numbers of homeless in our city actually became more extant and more apparent. And that's, that, that's a group that we should be tackling anyway. It's an issue that we should be tackling out with this bill, because most of the questions that you asked are out with this bill, but they're not out with the competency of the executive or my other ministerial colleagues. And that's where your questions have been made today, they've been heard today, and I've, I make sure that the transcript of this debate is shared with all my ministerial colleagues, as was raised, I think, by, by Claire Sugden as well, because although the focus is now on my department and what we can do in tackling COVID-19, um, it also has to be on others and how they support um, health approach. Um, you, you, she, sorry, Rachel, you, you also spoke about the removal of, of liberties. Um, for those who know, know me and my politics, know that this bill would not be in my political way of going or my political thought uh, in any direction. But I see this bill as, ne as necessary because there's no greater removal of personal liberty than the removal of life. And if we don't enact and if we don't move quick enough at this point in time in the steps that we need to take, that's exactly um, what we're talking about. And it will be the greatest, greatest failure if we remove the liberty of life for more of our constituents than actually has to be. Um, moving on, I, moving on to, to, to Jim um, Alistair. Jim, I thank you for your personal words of support. 
um, and not only for me but the rest of our, our health department. I referred yesterday in, in media that I what was going to come forward because we'd had an indication that I thought they were draconian. Now, in, in your description of Dracon, where he used the penalty of death for those who failed to comply with his rules and regulations, folks, I think it was a not description because these rules are draconian. Because, like Dracon, if people refuse to abide by the advice and guidance that this Department of Health has given, that the measures that are in this bill, we will cost others' lives. And that's where they are draconian. And that's why they have to be enforced. And I think that's why, if we take these steps now, we have the ability to fight back against this virus that is hitting us across Northern Ireland at this minute in time. He also asked in regards to the civil contingencies legislation, this bill is to supplement and enforce any gaps that were found within our legislation, Scottish legislation, Welsh and English legislation, to make sure that we were encapsulating those gaps of provision that were there, and probably going further in the challenges to, to civil liberty that we, we, we value and we endear um, in our country. So it's about supplementing and supporting the legislation that's there and plugging that in. And it has been um, on a four-nation approach uh, to make sure that those pieces of legislation are encapsulated, aren't consistent across across the hum across the country. Um, I, I know you and John O'Dowd had a, had a had a had a challenge in regards to to, to um, where you were going. Your points, your questions are, are well made, and John's response was was equally valid. Folks, will I use the army? Will I call in the army if I have to? If we get to a stage that they can provide a service that we can't, folks, I'll use whoever's at my disposal. I'll use whatever tool I have at my disposal to tackle this virus. If the Irish army want to come up and help us too, when they've sorted down there, I'd be more than happy to welcome them. So, folks, let's not let this debate or this issue be politicised, because it hasn't to date. And I don't think it would serve this House or the individuals well. And I know that wasn't where the members were going, but it was legitimate concerns. But what I do want to put on record is the co-working that we've already had between East, West and North, South, from our Chief Medical Officers, from the Public Health Agency here in Northern Ireland, from the HSE in South. Our first case in Northern Ireland was someone who travelled through Dublin. We were able to sort that contract case out because of the the establishment and the relationship that we both have on either sides of the border. So there is ability to work across borders, all borders. If we have to use it, we will. Um, in regards, I, I, I think um, um, in regards to I think points that both uh, Jim Allister and Claire Sugden asked in regards to definitions about security and social security and the issues in regards to statutory sick pay. I, I don't have the detail. And there's no point of me even trying to, to look on it in this file because I, I've been leading in the health bit. I've been left with, with, with the delivery of this bill, but I'll get the answers for the members because for, for the questions that you are asked and are apt, and the, 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 part, the Minister of Communities um, has come into the chamber to make another statement. I don't know if some of her statement will cover some of the questions um, that are being raised. Um, uh, Jerry McCarl's contribution he asked for, for regular updates. I've already committed. I'll come back and give updates on, on the health components of this bill. In regards to notifications of migrants to the, the Home Office, no, I won't do it. Um, and for the access to, to free health care, um, COVID-19 is now a notifiable disease, so there should be no restriction. And there is no restriction in Northern Ireland in our NHS in, in receiving free health care anyway, so it's not, it, it's not a concern um, that, sh that should be there. Uh, the contributions then, I think it was the final contribution then from, from Claire Sugden. Um, this is about the people. This is about ensuring that as many as our, of our people survive and that's why this leg legislation has been brought forward in regards to statutory sick pay and all the rest of it. The Minister of Communities, I'm sure, will, will update the House at some time. Um, as again, she asked you know, about 
the assembly questions. I, I, I covered that, that point earlier. Um, and um, she has she has been in contact with me about a number of cases and, and we'll keep working we'll keep working with those. Um, in regards to executive colleagues coming here to provide regular updates. Um, if I was nervous or, or fret of, of members' input into this debate or whatever I was doing, um, I wouldn't be standing here. I wouldn't have taken the, the legislation forward and brought it here. So I think she can be assured from me for that commitment. But again, Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to emphasise that the measures in the coronavirus bill are temporary. They are proportionate to the threat we face and will only be used when strictly necessary and will remain in place for as long as required to respond to the situation. Mr Speaker, the provisions within the bill are intended to protect life, the health of the public and to ensure that health and social care staff are supported to deal with the significant extra pressure which is being placed on the health system. I would like to put on record my thanks to Executive colleagues for their ongoing collaboration and support throughout this process. I believe that this has undoubtedly shown how the Executive can work collectively and effectively together with one clear purpose, which is to ensure that we have the necessary legislative measures in place to deal with the outbreak of COVID-19. I would like to express my gratitude to the Health Committee for all its efforts and assistance and to all the other committees who have taken forward their different parts of this bill. In particular, I am grateful to the committees for taking the time to examine the legislative consent memorandum relating to the bill, for the pragmatic approaches that they have taken on this issue and their positive engagement with all officials. I must also add that all of these actions were performed within a very demanding timescale, and I would like to thank the chairs and the members of the committees for their endeavours. Finally, I also want to pay tribute to our brilliantly selfless health and social care staff across all our professions who are working tirelessly to care for our friends and loved ones in this unprecedented period. Staff across all departments and wellness, as well as this House and the Assembly, who have worked over the last number of weeks with their colleagues in Wales and Scotland and England to make sure that we had a bill that actually brought, forwards, uh, brought forward the needs and the requests of this House. But it's also to thank those other backroom staff who are working tirelessly in the preparation as to how we flatten the peak, but will eventually have to tackle the peak. So for those professionals within my department, for those professionals in the Health and Social Care Board, for the professionals in the Public Health Agency to use all, I personally thank you at this minute in time, because the worst is yet to come. But by planning for the worst and working for the best, I believe we will get through this. However, it is important that we all play our part and we must all work together. From businesses prioritising the welfare of their employees to people continuing to do the basic things, like thoroughly washing your hands. In conclusion, I want to reiterate that I consider the coronavirus bill to be an important and positive measure which will help to ensure that Northern Ireland departments have the necessary legislative measures available so that we are all well prepared to respond in a way that offers substantial protection to the public. In practical terms, I believe that members understand the importance for Northern Ireland provisions to be included in the bill and will give their support to the motion today. Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to pass on my personal condolences to the families of those who have already lost someone to COVID-19. There will be more, but by taking the responsible actions in this House, we can reduce that number. Mr Speaker, Deputy Speaker, I commend the motion to the House. Members, the question is that the amendment standing in the name of the Minister be agreed. All those in favour say aye. 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 Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that the motion as amended be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Next item of business is a motion to approve the statutory rule. I will ask the clerk to read.